Hello? Hey, everybody, we'll be getting started Sorry. in a minute. All right, it looks like it is 12 o'clock. So let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating in our sixth stakeholder sharing session. This is the last of our stakeholder sharing sessions. Um, again, if anyone has been on the last calls, I'm just going to go over some logistics and ground rules for our session today. So currently, most of you are on this session right now as participants. However, once I'm done talking, I will switch everyone over to a panelist so that we can all see and hear each other. Um, please note, though, once we do switch you over, if we're hearing background noise, um, we're going to mute you, but feel free to unmute yourself at any time um, to contribute to the conversation. So you can unmute yourself. The bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom window, there's a little microphone, and you can use that to mute and unmute yourself. Um, you can also temporarily unmute yourself just to um, say a comment by pressing and holding the space bar on your keyboard. So also, once we switch you over and we're done sharing our screen, you'll be able to enable the gallery view on Zoom so that you can see the most people at once. To do this, you can click in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom window. Um, it may say speaker view or gallery view right now. So you can click between those to, for your preference. If you have any issues doing this or it's not appearing, um, as I'm saying, you can always refer back to the registration confirmation or the reminders that were sent by Zoom. And there's some helpful hints at the bottom and some helpful links as well to help you through that. So as you may have already seen, if you're looking at our screen here, we are using the chat box to introduce ourselves. So if you haven't already, if you could please just type in your name and organization so we know who's on the call. Another great way to identify people is to have you rename yourself on Zoom. So you can do this if you hover over and right click on where you see your name or your, um, once you're a panelist, where your face is appearing. You can right click on the little video and click rename from there. Or you could hover over again your face or where your name appears and you'll see three little dots appear in the upper right hand corner. You can click on that and rename yourself. Again, your name and organization would be helpful. So lastly, it's important today um, to keep our conversations related to post-COVID-19 dental. Um, with that, I think we are ready to get started. So Helen, you can take it from here. All right, thank you, Amy, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again um, from all of us here at PCOH for joining us for the sixth and final sharing session, um, as we have tried to uh, maintain communications as best we can um, during a crazy time, which of course we'll be talking about today. So um, for today, if you've joined us on some of the other sessions, we had you know a, a couple of people sort of prepared to present some information ahead of time and we talked a little bit about the work that PCOH has been doing and, and working on in several different areas. Um, today I think we're sort of all in a place um, of some indecision and and you know some unknown things so we're going to be probably doing a little bit more discussion um, but before we get into that I do just want to take a, a minute or two for those who maybe haven't joined us on um, a previous meeting and may want to learn just a little bit more about our work as a coalition. So um, we are the State Oral Health Coalition for Pennsylvania. We're part of a national network of oral health coalitions. 
I think right now we've got about 44 or so across the country. Um, and we do get together with those folks on a regular basis to sort of connect and learn and, and share ideas and resources. Um, we are not, um, we're made up of a lot of different individuals and organizations um, from around the state. So we don't represent any one particular group. Um, we're not a provider organization or we're not specifically just a community organization. Um, we sort of get our strength from all the different stakeholders that make us up. Um, and it's, it's a really, um, it's a great place to, to work um, and, and be involved in. So uh, a lot of our work centers around connecting people who are looking for information, resources, education. Um, and then we also help our state department of health and the oral health program on implementing um, programs that are designed to improve oral health for Pennsylvanians. Uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3 and we operate using uh, mostly grant dollars and as well as uh, corporate sponsorships and you know private public donations. Um, we all work virtually. Um, so if you ever need any assistance, um, you're always able to reach out to PCUH staff um, as we work from virtual home offices and travel around the state when we're able to. Um, so that's sort of a little bit about the background of uh, what PCOH is, um, the sort of the things that we focus on. We try to maintain our efforts around four main priorities. Um, the first is the oral workforce in our state. So that includes not just you know, dentists, hygienists, assistants, um, dental staff. It also includes anybody who sort of involves oral health care and delivery into their work. So it may be pediatricians, it may be community health workers, um, but anybody who could sort of be considered part of that oral workforce. Um, we also advocate for community water fluoridation. Our state is um, woefully behind on meeting some of the um, national goals for statewide levels of optimally fluoridated water. So um, we work uh, with a lot of different organizations, um, communities that are you know, facing challenges around community water fluoridation as well as um, even individual water operators and water systems. Um, our third priority is really looking at Pennsylvania's most vulnerable populations, you know, whether that makes them vulnerable by, you know, geographic location, whether it's their, you know, racial or, racial or ethnic minorities, um, whether it's, um, you know, individuals with disabilities. There are a lot of reasons that, that we sort of see where people end up being more vulnerable to oral disease. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are promoting health equity to, to really lift up those issues. Um, and lastly, um, of course, as a coalition, we do a lot of advocacy and we try to implement oral health policy into pretty much everything that we can. Um, so, you know, if, if some, something that you're working on, um, you know, and you need sort of that oral health spin to it, um, that's sort of where we, we find our fit in a lot of things. So working with a, a lot of chronic disease programs in the state, um, other coalitions, you know, some health coalitions, um, some others that we, we really try to look at how do, we, how do we keep oral health top of mind. So if you're new to the coalition and you want to catch up on some of the work that we've done in the past, please feel free, check out our website, check out our YouTube channel. Um, you'll have uh, the link here that's on the slides after the call today. So you'll be able to click right on there if you wanna see some of our past recordings and webinars. Okay, so that's sort of just a five minute synopsis of what our coalition is. Um, so the discussion today, of course, um, when we first started planning these stakeholder sharing sessions, which probably was back in late March, um, early April, maybe, um, you know, we knew that with the pandemic, we weren't going to be able to gather and convene folks like we normally would. So typically the coalition has two uh, meetings in one side of the state in the spring and two meetings on the other side of the state in the fall. And um, we also hold a statewide summit every other year. So this year was our year to hold the summit. Um, and so we, we knew for sure our May meetings were not gonna be able to be held. And we were really um, hesitant, but we eventually postponed the statewide summit um, too. So uh, we wanted to still convene people. We wanted to still have people 
have people have a chance to talk. And so we focused our other stakeholder sharing sessions on the topics that we typically talk about. Um, but we couldn't sort of ignore the elephant in the room and sort of, we didn't want to sprinkle COVID into everything because obviously then we would all derail and that would be sort of the highlight of all the conversations. So, um, you know, the world in Pennsylvania has sort of just been knocked off its axis at this point. Um, you know, I think that we've seen a, a pretty big change in the trajectory that we've all been heading down and, and we're not real sure how long term that's going to be. Um, so, you know, I wanted to have an opportunity for some discussion amongst all of you who have, you know, the stake in this to really talk about, you know, I don't want to say a silver lining or any opportunities, but I do want to say that we may have an opportunity to sort of rebuild our systems. Um, and so when things are kind of starting from scorched earth, we, we might be able to um, look at changes we could make. Um, so with that, you know, we're going to be, I want to talk a little bit about where we're at right now. So, you know, are we looking at, at situations that will be short term or long term and sort of what everybody's thoughts are on that? Um, because, you know, as a coalition, we do what our stakeholders sort of tell us to do. We want to be guided by the needs of our communities. Um, so, you know, I'd love to hear from everybody sort of what you're seeing, if you feel some of this stuff is short term, some of this is long term. Um, and then also, you know, what kind of systems change, you know, changes can we see from what we could pull out of this? So I'm gonna just sort of um, talk a minute or two on each of these things, but then I really do wanna just open it up for discussion um, because that's, that's really the more important thing that we're trying to accomplish here. So these are some of the big things. So our coalition has been um, getting a lot of questions and concerns and um, obviously, lots of emails and Facebook messages and calls um, from not only dental providers, um, but dental staff and patients as well. Um, we've actually I had two calls this morning from patients that are just looking for answers of, of where to seek dental care and, and, and just ensuring that it's safe to do so. And we want to make sure that everybody feels that it's safe to seek dental care. Um, so I do want to just mention that we have been working um, you know, with the partners at the Department of Health and we've been talking with the provider associations as well. Um, and you know, we're currently still under this May 8th guidance um, that really has held everybody in dentistry to, to sort of three main check boxes um, you know, when we're trying to decide what kind of care should be provided um, and how to provide it. Um, the first is that the Department of Health is encouraging everyone to look at the incidence of COVID in your area. So even though Department of Health guidance is statewide, um, you know, we can use those county colors. I hate to even bring them up, um, but we can use those to sort of help determine how serious is the incidence of COVID in our area. And that sort of helps to dictate, um, you know, what services should be provided at that point. Um, so that's sort of number one. Number two is, do we have the proper PPE to provide services? Um, and the CDC has, you know, under the State Board of Dentistry, if you go to their website, you'll see they have a, a nice little document there that says, yes, you must follow the Department of Health guidance for what procedures are allowed, but two, you must follow CDC guidance for infection control. And if you can't follow CDC guidance, then you should not do the procedure. So our most recent CDC guidance came out May 21st. Um, it's on the PCOH website. So if you haven't seen it, please check it out. It's, it's pretty clear. Um, and then third, the last sort of factor in making a decision of, of what services to provide is, is the patient going to suffer irreversible harm without the treatment? Um, and I've seen Dr. Levine has kind of summed that up as acute care um, in some of her press conferences. So I think that um, that's sort of where, you know, you have to take a little bit of perspective um, in, in offering what services can be done. So I did just want to remind everyone of that before we have the conversation, because um, we've, we've had so many questions come in about things being, you know, maybe not as clear as people would like. Um, and I think that there's a reason for that. We can't have the same blanket guidance that applies to 
say Montgomery County or Philadelphia County who are still in the red that would apply to some of the counties in, in the Northwest that have gone green. So, um, you know, that's the reason they're giving the providers and all the licensees a little bit of, of, of leeway in determining what's best for, for themselves as providers and the patients. Um, so just wanted to say that before we get into any other discussion. Um, obviously we can see when we're talking about um, are these short-term or long-term changes for COVID, um, we're looking at infection control. Um, we've always sort of in dentistry operated on this standard precautions protocol, uh, meaning treat everyone as if they have, you know, like a bloodborne disease, um, which is fine, except that in, uh, you know, questionably airborne pandemic, um, there are actually, a, there's a higher level of precautions. So right now we're following more transmission-based precautions. Is that going to, to stay? Are we going to continuously have to act, act that way? Um, is it going to stay that way till there's a vaccine? Um, is it gonna stay that way forever? We don't know. Um, but making sure that you're following the current CDC guidelines, as I said, they came out May 21st um, for now and watching for any new updates is gonna be really, really important. You know, are we gonna have to continue to screen our patients? So, um, you know, again, that's, that's hit on in the CDC guidance. Um, but making sure that we're sharing with our patients that dentistry, you know, is safe, that we know how to, to provide it safely, um, and that it's important is really a big deal. And I think we have to, you know, impart that into our patients. Um, when we talk about continuing education, so we've noticed there have been some changes um, that, whereas in Pennsylvania, licensees were able to previously get half of their continuing education online. Um, and then half had to be done in person. So we've seen the shift now to um, the governor has said, you know, it's fine to go ahead and get all of your classes online. So um, will we see that stay the same? Is it going to change? Um, are people going to have long term effects of being worried about gathering in, in large groups? So um, that's something that, you know, might be something to discuss or if anyone has any thoughts on it. Student requirements, same thing. You know, we've seen some relaxation in some of the board requirements and, and what's coming out for our dental students and dental hygiene students. Um, are they going to stay? Are they going to go back to normal? Um, you know, it's one of these things, I think, especially with a lot of people teleworking, um, that we've all sort of realized in some situations we can do it. <laughs> Um, so at, at some point, you know, maybe it makes sense to sort of stick with the new ways. Um, and then lastly, you know, with the, the concern around aerosols during COVID-19, I think we've seen the shift to how do we prov provide procedures and care um, without relying on aerosol generating procedures. So for those of us working in public health, we've already been looking at these things. Um, we know that medical management of dental disease is, is a great option as opposed to what we would call traditionally surgical management. Um, so more of that drill and fill mentality. Um, you know, now we wanna try to look at the root causes of the disease, prevent the disease from happening in the first place. And then if, you know, we can't prevent the disease, making sure we, we manage the disease um, by removing as little tooth structure as possible. So again, those are sort of where I'm looking at the questions we're getting short term versus long term. The other side of this is then these are sort of things that we've been looking at for, I would say, uh, probably at least the last five years or so as possible improvements in our entire dental system. So, you know, do we have this sort of specification of procedures? We've already started to sort of break down dentistry in a way that we offer um, different services at different levels. We have specialists doing more specialty care now. Um, we've got general dentists doing less of that specialty care. Um, and so do we start to sort of look at, um, you know, certain operatory setups for aerosol versus non-aerosol? Do we do levels of procedures at a different kind of way than we would have before? Um, and then is this really the time? We, we've been talking medical dental integration for years and years and years. Um, so do we take advantage of having this, this whole new world to live in to really look at ways to, to have and achieve true integration? Um, and then again, how do we pay for the care? So value-based care models, um, for those who aren't familiar, sort of look at ways to, instead of paying providers for 
basically providing treatment for sickness, that we start to pay providers for keeping their patients healthy. So, you know, why not reimburse providers for doing the things like nutritional counseling and tobacco cessation counseling so that we can get people healthy and then reward the providers for having healthy patients. Um, that's going to save money in the long run. We know these things. So um, that's something that uh, I think we've been pushed to at this point. Um, so now that we have to offer so many services via teledentistry, um, you know, and, and telephone triage and these kinds of things, we may start to see some shifts in those models as well. Um, and I mentioned teledentistry, we've seen a huge uptick, of course, in that process. We know nationally about 25% of dentists are doing some teledentistry right now. Um, that's from the ADA's Health Policy Institute. Um, they also reported yesterday on their webinar that um, the latest survey they've done shows that dentistry is a, about 54% of pre-COVID capacity right now. So that's a pretty big change because three weeks ago, we were most offices were under 5% of volume. So to jump to 54% of normal volume within a three-week period, I think, is means that dentistry is getting back to work. Um, and those are national numbers. So, you know, you've got some states that don't have restrictions and you've got some states that are still, um, you know, completely shut down. So, um, and then lastly, I think in terms of just systems change and what opportunities we might have, um, I think we really have to start looking at workforce. Um, and one of the concerns always has been our workforce um, in that we have an aging workforce. Um, in 2015, which was our last published workforce study, um, you know, we were told that 27% of the dentists were, you know, 65 and older. So um, we're starting to sort of look at, well, are these folks going to come back to work? Are they going to reopen their doors? Um, and what will that mean for us long term for the offices that decide either to close or to retire? And then the other side of this, and we have a very smart um, board member who pointed this out, um, was what about the young dentist? What's going to entice them during this time to stay in Pennsylvania? Why wouldn't they go to a state that's less restrictive or maybe they feel has handled this crisis better? So how do we spin what's happening now to make Pennsylvania a desirable place to work? Because um, we really are going to be struggling, um, we believe, with access to providers in the next year plus, maybe more. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's something else that, um, so PCOH has been working on. We have a survey that just got published this week um, to look at how many providers are, are planning to adjust their time, not come back at all, um, you know, and pinpointing the exact zip codes where we may end up with some, some pretty big holes in our provider networks. So um, that's, and I'll put the link to the survey in the slides before we send them out. So, you know, if you're working with dentists or you are a dentist and you haven't had a chance to see that slide and fill it out or survey, please do. Um, we'll also be sending that out via postcard to all the dentists in the state in the next week or so. So um, that information is coming out and then we will be reporting back, of course, to everyone on that, um, just so that everyone sort of knows what we have discovered. So. That's really all I, and that was like the fastest I've done any of these things, but I think the reason is that, you know, it really doesn't matter what PCOH thinks about COVID-19. It really matters um, how you all are doing as, you know, providers and community members and advocates. And so then how do we, I want to hear from you to know what your biggest concerns are, so. I will ask, and if you guys can join by video, it really truly does make the conversation so much better. And I promise we will not judge. Um, you can have dogs and kids in the background. You can have your hair not did. We don't care. Um, I think that is one thing we have all learned from COVID is um, that we, <laughs> we're learning a whole new way to work with all kinds of distractions. So um, I would encourage you to please join by video if you can, um, and then, you know, obviously speak up. I will call people out, so. Um. I'll go ahead and start. Oh, and I <laughs> Good morning, this is Nora. Um, I was just gonna give you a, just a quick snippet from um, the here and now right over where I am. So I'm over on the western, almost 
in Ohio. If I jog really fast, I'm practically in Ohio. Um, and so the, what I'm hearing from dentists in our area is they're up and ready to go. They feel comfortable. The hygienists are super comfortable with it. They said they've got all the PPE they need. And so I, I was really impressed with that. Their schedules are full till maybe September even. Um, so I found that interesting, but I also know downtown Pittsburgh is a little different. Um, I'm hearing more concerns that people ride the bus to the office and where do they wait, especially with summer and it's going to be hot. Can they can't stand in a parking lot. Um, so I'm hearing a little bit of both, but so some encouraging, some hurdles still left to go over with the whole COVID. Yeah. I, is anyone on, I, and, and, and I can call them out, but you know, for those of you who are on the other side of the state, because that's been something that's sort of been interesting, is if you talk to a provider who's, you know, in the Northwest, they don't quite understand that the problems are different in the Southeast. So, um, because, you know, it's, it, it really just isn't in the West like it is in the East. So, um, for those in the East, I see Eve just went off of mute, so she'll probably share some of the, the Reading perspective. Yeah, I, I got a phone call last evening. Uh, by the way, uh, I was just, the reason I was late, I was on the NOHC session this morning and the Surgeon General had some wonderful data. So as soon as I get the charts, I'll let you know. I wasn't smart enough to cop to do the photo shots today. But anyway, my um, pediatric dentist who's just up the street from us um, called me last night and they had a 14 year old with autism um, who had been a patient at, all, at, at my, my old practice. And he said, but I, I don't think the mother's telling the truth because it's not sounding right. Because he had not been to a dentist until January of this year, ever in his life. Um, I went back and he had been to one visit and, and then he had, that was in 2015 and then he hadn't come back and yeah, but anyway, and they, it was probably, um, based on what I could see from the chart and what I could see from what he was telling me, the reason that the child hadn't come back and hadn't gone to the dentist was that they had no insurance because they had private insurance that was not real good private insurance when they saw us in 2015. They had one other visit in 2019, again with the private insurance that wasn't very good. Um, and anyway, somehow the child had gone to the other pediatric dental practice here in Reading that, that participates with all of the managed care organizations. And um, they had, I, I'm not sure that I, I was clear, but either they didn't do any x-rays or they did them but didn't do anything else and told the mothers that he was going to have to go to Philadelphia to an oral surgeon um, to have his teeth pulled because his permanent teeth pulled because they were so rotten. Um, so my dentist here was going to see him today and compliment the mother that at least she's finally bringing him to care. Um, but what I found out from him um, was that there are at least two other doctor dentists in Eastern Pennsylvania, three other dental practices in Eastern Pennsylvania that are open to see Medicaid patients. We were all real concerned about that. Um, there are two people in Allentown um, and uh, one in the suburbs of Philadelphia that, that has always been there, Dr. Goldsteiger's practice. Um, and, and then uh, Dr. Perez is, is staying open and they're, they're seeing um, Medicaid patients. Um, and, and what they're doing is having them wait in the, in the um, parking lot and then come in and, and they have their equipment. Um, slow, he says that um, it's he and his wife that are practicing together and his, his wife has 
been totally engulfed in working over at Reading Hospital with the dental emergencies that they keep calling her for. So, yes, it's a mess. For what it's worth. <laughs> uh, my general dentist had a very interesting perspective. Um, he, was, he was trained in the military and did a lot of service in the military and he does he does really good quality dentistry. He, he's been taking blood pressures for years and, and so on. And he said, Eve, we, we know how to deal with this kind of stuff. We've dealt with HP, HIV now for years. And he said, we just have to adapt to adding one more precaution. And I thought that was an interesting perspective, a positive perspective. It is. Um, and Darcy, I hope you don't mind if I call you out. Um, I was very curious to hear um, how your clinic's doing, if you guys, because I haven't heard from you. So, I don't know, Darcy, if you can unmute, I would love to hear how you guys are doing. Maybe she stepped away. I always hate calling people out, but at the same time, I'm just dying to... <laughs> This is Angie. I'm on the eastern side. Um, yeah, Angie, please, please uh, share. I'm, I'm in Montgomery County, which was the epicenter of Pennsylvania to start this whole coronavirus thing. So we're still in red and uh, we're expected to go to yellow next Friday. I haven't heard anything from my employer yet other than he sent a PowerPoint of what we are going to be doing when we will reopen. But I haven't heard anything from him as far as a reopening date. I work in PETO also. Um, I'm not down the city out on the mobile unit anymore. I don't know if you know that, Helen, but I'm in, I'm in private PETO practice now. And, um, uh, you know, we have the patients going to be in the parking lot and come in and to all the toys, you know, because the kids, you know, are going to be out of the waiting room and the magazines and one person in at a time go right back to the operatory. Same thing that, you know, they've been suggesting and stuff like that. So he has a whole PowerPoint and everything of, of procedures to be done. But as of now, because we're still in the red, um, we haven't opened yet. I don't know. According to Dr. Levine, she didn't want periodic cleanings and exams done until the green. So I don't know what's going to happen and when, when we're going back, so to say. But I know he did say even um, when we do start seeing the kids, we're just going to hand scale them, okay, if, and uh, debride basically with the scaler. And then um, instead of polishing, because it, even the polishing creates an aerosol that we're just going to wipe the teeth with a gauze, you know, after um, scaling and debridement with the scaler is done. So that's our plan. It, what's, what's your general thoughts, Angie, on like just from your community? I mean, are people, do you think people are ready to return to dentistry, like in terms of the patients? Quite interesting because I had a friend of mine, um, all after May 8th, I <laughs> went to the dentist's office. I said, you have a cleaning appointment? I said, you have a problem or is this regular cleaning? She goes, oh, this is a regular cleaning. And that was before they then released the other guideline. I'm like, whoa, because, you know, now, you know, then they changed things up a little bit and they got more specific about what that actually meant on May 8th. So I don't know if that dentist office is still open and doing regular cleanings. I mean, that office is only like 15 minutes away from me <laughs> or if they did um, uh, change their pattern of operation after that clarification came out. I don't know. They're doing the same thing in Berks and we're still in red. It's the and same thing over in Pittsburgh and it was red and there were offices that I was aware of that were working. So yeah. yeah. Helen, it's Darcy. <laughs> hey, there you are. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. How are you? No good, thanks. Yeah, I was I was really curious because we haven't had a lot of input from the free clinics and I was just curious as to sort of how you guys were handling this and, and sort of what, what your take is on it all. 
Um, we are not allowed to be open yet. The medical clinic and dental clinic are both closed. Um, we have um, staff in there providing telemedicine and also providing our patients with medicines if they need them, insulins, the high blood pressure things that we have in the office. So we feel like our patients are still being taken care of on the medical side. However, on my side, a little differently, obviously. Um, if a dental person calls, Chris triages the message to me. Um, I keep a list. Actually, yesterday, uh, we went to Dr. Carr's office, who is one of my volunteers, and we did some denture cases, which we had started way back in March when this all started and he wanted to get them moving. Um, so we did that yesterday, and actually I have to get off the call about in 15 minutes because I'm going to Dr. Grossman's office. He is seeing five of my emergency patients. Um, they've been on antibiotics in the past. We can't do anything else. We There's nothing we can do but bring them in. So he's actually been kind enough to see my true emergency patients. Most of my patients are emergencies, but he's really taking care of the ones that we just can't do anything else for except for C. So um, generally, I guess I've been in contact with four or five of my volunteers. They are seeing emergencies, have started um, seeing other patients. Again, very spaced out. Chairs in the offices are up. Um, same thing, wait in the waiting room. Um, no hygiene whatsoever. So that's starting to hurt, obviously, their bottom line also. So, but, and no really indication of when we're going to be allowed to do that. But yeah. um, we're moving right along. Um, you know, again, I, my list is growing day by day of people calling that are in pain and and billing fell out. I just, as we were, as I was talking, my phone just went off from Chris. Someone else called that lost a billing. So <laughs> it's gonna, when I go back, it's going to be never ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you guys typically have a waiting list anyway, right? Oh my, yes. Yeah. 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 It's and just, now they have three stars and four stars and <laughs> so I've started a waiting list for the waiting list. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's something that I think everybody would love a little more direction on is, you know, like what's the easiest way to sort of prioritize those needs for, for the families and for the individuals? Because I feel like, um, you know, it, it's one of those where no matter what, we're going to have to prioritize. And so, you know, Darcy's from a free clinic, which we've got about nearly 20 in the state that offer dental services. Um, and as far as I know, very few of them have remained open. Um, most of them, you know, just like Darcy said, just, you know, had to sort of close the clinical doors completely. Um, and those are already situations where these are safety net clinics to catch the people who can't get seen elsewhere. Um, so, you know, I think that we're going to have some long-term um, patient buildup even there, um, you know, in addition to the, to the private practices and the FQHCs. Right. So. We've had an average of probably 10 new patients a week calling and needing help, lost my insurance, lost my job. You know, I mean, when we open our doors, it's just going to be absolutely crazy. I, I just know it. And we've been screening these new patients and, of course, putting them on the list. So the list that never ends. But it's, I'm, I know it's just going to be crazy because, I mean, I mean, people are losing their insurance by the day. So, yeah, it's going to be a struggle. And that was something else that we had talked about, and probably our, our managed care organizations could speak to a little bit of this. But, you know, we they expected to see a, a pretty decent um, increase in those enrolled in Medicaid, um, you know, because for people who might be were sort of on the line before that now are eligible for Medicaid because they've lost their jobs. Um, you know, that, that we may have a situation where there would be increase. And I just saw a thing come out this morning um, that they analyzed all the states, but Pennsylvania wasn't included. I don't know why, but um, the, the really the biggest increase they saw was only about 2%, which I thought was better than I thought it would be, because um, that hopefully means that people are maintaining some of their insurance. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't know if anybody has sort of seen an increase um, 
you know, Dana or Nora, if, if you guys have seen an increase in your numbers for just enrollees. Well, our social uh, director also does, like she'll help them get enrolled into the, into the system. And she has tried, and then again, if it's for dental, the problem of no, not many providers take it in Luzerne County. So you're, it's just one big ugly. So then they get medical um, assistance for help for their medical, but then they're still eligible for me. So they go right back on the list anyway. So it's just, it's just never ending. I don't, there's gotta be an answer for all of this. I just, my heart breaks every day and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, I think um, we haven't really gotten any numbers or anything yet um, about an increase in members for UPMC, but um, I'm sure, you know, that there will be, just like you said, too, you know, with many losing their jobs, now they are eligible. Um, I think we will probably see an increase, you know, once they do get numbers. Um, I'm in the, uh, in Erie County, and we still aren't green yet. We're probably one of the only counties um, around here that um, isn't green today. So, um, but I do know that there are several offices that are open, um, many of the ortho offices and even some dental offices, but there are still offices that are waiting because they said they're still waiting for the PPE that they aren't able to get yet um, and wanna make sure that their uh, staff is safe. Um, hearing from um, Lisa Maisonette and the PDA president, um, that have reached out to Pima for, with letters to include us. You know, it sounds like, yeah, we're still, you know, they're gonna consider it. So whether we'll, you know, get anything, you know, upgraded that we are essential, um, that they will, you know, allot us, you know, more of the PPE, um, that'll be interesting to see. And I can, I'd love to offer a little bit of a, I don't know if it's the right or the wrong approach here, but maybe it's, um, it's sort of just my, my personal thoughts, not the thoughts or feelings of PCOH. Um, but, you know, I think that something I've noticed from all of this is that, you know, I don't know if everybody's quite realizing that it's bigger than dental. Um, you know, and, and with these PPE allotments and everything else, there's nothing that stops a provider from purchasing them from anybody that they've always purchased their PPE from. Um, I really question the thoughts of, of asking for some from the state allotment um, when uh, nursing homes and hospitals don't have PPE. <laughs> So I, I just, I, and it, it doesn't mean I'm discounting dental. We all know I would never do that. Um, I just think that from a public health measure and knowing what the things that we, we maybe need to prioritize. And I want to make sure too, that there's enough PPE to see all the emergencies. Um, so, you know, I really, I struggle. Um, I don't know if anyone else has kind of had those thoughts or, you know, if you think bigger than dental, well, I, I definitely do too. I mean, I, I mean, yes, we definitely need to save it for the front lines, you know, as well. Um, but it was there, and I don't know how, how right this is, but or if it's true, but um, that they were telling like the like Henry Shine and some of the dental companies not to give it to the dental offices that the, it was to go directly to the front line. That is correct. Is that correct? Okay. My, my, my general dentist affirmed that he's had stuff on order. And he did not, you know, when they issued the call, it, neither he nor my pediatric dentist friend, when they issued the call to give their PPE for, to the medical folks, he said, no, because I won't have it when I need it for my emergencies. <laughs> and I thought that was totally appropriate. I really did. But he's got... He said that he ordered, don't, don't hold me to these time frames, but he said that, that he ordered stuff, I think it's been a month now, and they promised it in a week, and he still doesn't have it from, and I think it was Henry Schein. It was one of the big, big guys. So, yeah. 
so where is everybody getting their their PPE then? You know, if if they're, I mean, it's did they have it just? They had it. They, they had it, but they still had to get the ninety five masks. Right. He has enough for his his emergency stuff, but he doesn't have enough, you know, to open up. Enough for that. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. That's yeah. Not, not nice. No. It's sad, though, you know. Saying that they have it, to order it from them, that they have it. I get like one or two emails every day. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting, though, when you talk about the medical, um, I have a nurse friend who works at an elective out outpatient surgery center, and they've been up and running. And it's like, but we have enough PPE to supply for elective surgeries, yet dentists are struggling. You know, it is yeah. our, you know, the whole hierarchy. And of course, it should go for emergencies and medical first. But, you know, I feel for dentists who are just trying to keep themselves going sorry i live by the airport if you can hear the crazy noise in the background <laughs> i have all the windows open it's so beautiful so anyway but yeah i don't know it's a it's it the ppe thing is crazy any thoughts on testing that was the other thing i think that we've heard a lot about i think initially the ada was talking a lot about that like you know should we be supplying you know, um, on the spot testing for dental offices, but it was it was funny. I saw something on the governor's page yesterday that was sort of talking about how many tests they were able to distribute. And I mean, the amount that they've distributed like to the whole state was like pretty much would only give every dental office about six tests. So like, I was like, well, maybe that's the reason, you know, that, that we're not seeing it. Um, you know, we're not seeing a lot of those, um, that big push there. So I don't know if anybody sees that happening. Like, do we see that six months from now that everybody's going to be running on the spot antibody testing in the dental office? And who's paying for these tests? Huh. They're not cheap. They're $130. A piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was a webinar on Monday, or not Monday, Tuesday, I listened into, it was a little dry, so I didn't, I, I apologize, I didn't listen to everything, but he was saying the one thing to be cautious, if dental offices are going to be testing, and then you be, become known as an office that tests, are you going to shy away patients who don't want to be in an office where there's positive tests, and then what are you going to do with your results? We can't, and then the guy was saying, dentists can't diagnose, there was a whole, I mean, and there's so many false positives, I guess, with some of these tests that are not, he said, yeah, they're not particularly good. Yeah, he was, he was giving all the scenarios of it. It was interesting. So my medical yeah. folks have been talking a lot about the antibody testing and apparently they're not super effective yet from the antibody perspective. Um, there's a lot that are hesitant to order them. And honestly, some of the tests are taking a week or more to get back um, on the medical side. And so, I mean, I think until there's more accuracy and they can be done with a quicker turnaround, it, I don't know that it makes much sense for a dental office. And I don't know in terms of the, so not the antibody testing, but like the active infection, yeah, active infection testing. I don't know that too many dentists are gonna be comfortable with that whole swab aspect. I mean, maybe, but maybe not. Um, people already don't like going to the dentist most times, right? And then we're going to swab them? No, no. It's uh, a pharyngeal swab. It's nasty. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that would be a concern as well. Like, would that potentially keep patients away? Especially if they know that they're probably not, you know, they've been social distancing and they're probably okay. Would they want to go through that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, but, you know, if, if we're hearing that um, in some states, the National Guard is administering the tests, you know, it's like, yet, yet they don't have enough for, you know, maybe dental offices or enough for other states. I don't know. Do the test require a physician order? Yes. The antibody so the physician. ordering. Yes, ma'am. The antibody does too? Yeah. So whoever orders that is then responsible for the results, right? Correct. So if they get a positive, what do they do with it? 
tell the patient. There's nothing else to do unless the patient is really sick. Right? I mean. Yeah. Well, and then that lays into all of our tracking purposes as we're tracking right now. The reason that we have so many discrepancies is, you know, the more groups and individuals doing tests, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to keep track of all of those things. So again, if we had full integration of medical and dental electronic health records, um, <laughs> this would be a much, a, a wonderful thing. So again, like, so do we spin this? You know what I mean? In my mind, like for our advocacy efforts and everything else, like how much better could we be doing if we did have that full integration? Not only came up on Monday as well. They said, so you get the test and it's in the dental record. It can't, it doesn't go into the medical. So what are you doing? Again, he was like, what are we going to do with that information? Um, and yeah, and then there was the whole talk about, well, so HIV and tuberculosis, there's, we can't, we can't put those patients at the end of the day. You're not allowed to do any kind of change the way your protocol is, but nothing has been brought up yet on a COVID patient. So again, you get a positive test. Are you going to tell them they can't be seen? So what do you, why are you testing them? Is the guy was basically saying, so what do you, why are you testing? Right. Mm -hmm. If the medical and dental records were integrated, it could uh, ease fears about patients knowing that they're positive and not necessarily being symptomatic and going to the dentist anyhow. Um, mm -hmm. If the dentist was able to see that they had visited the doctor earlier in the week, earlier in the day, whatever the case may be, they could potentially say, hey, we need to delay treatment for two weeks. Um, again, Nora, I don't know whether that goes against, I don't know, like I, there's that side of it too, but the, if things were integrated, which we know we're not gonna get there tomorrow, um, but if they were integrated, you could see that and potentially use that to make informed treatment decisions in the dental office. So that might be a kind of spinning it, and if we had that capability, that would be a positive. Right. Before we get too far um, into another topic, I did want to circle back around and just give a little insight into what's going on on this side of the state and what I'm experiencing. This is Jasmine. Um, so a couple of the FQHCs obviously are up and running. However, we just moved into yellow today. So they're only providing emergency care. I spoke with the office manager of, from one in York who's been in the yellow a little longer than Dawson County. Um, and they're still only seeing emergency patients on limited staff. The dentists are working just a few hours a day to see emergencies. And they're telling their patients to call back in the next two weeks um, to move forward. So there's no SRP, no pro fees, no FMDs, nothing that's going to create aerosols or trying to limit it, obviously, um, and emergencies only. And Hamilton Health Center, uh, I did call in and they, um, they too are just providing emergency care, the one here in Dawson County, and really haven't received any direction, um, at least not the office manager, as far as what she provided on how they're gonna move forward um, with us just being in the yellow. So my private dentist, however, has PPE, but it's limited. He too is experiencing some challenges in getting it um, and is only seeing emergencies on a call by call basis. The office is completely shut down. So that's kind of what's going on out here that I, anyway, that I've experienced and um, looking forward to moving forward. Thank you, Jasmine. Yeah. You're welcome. It's interesting, the idea, you know, when you were first saying that, I'm thinking, well, if our free clinics, we have a higher percentage of free clinics closed versus open. We have a higher percentage of FQHCs doing emergency only care versus full on care. But yet I think we see that and, and that some of the private providers seem to be the ones most willing to just move ahead, um, which then does that make our gap in disparities even bigger? Yes. <laughs> so that if you have private insurance and you can afford to go to a private practice, you can get dental care right now 
But if you don't, uh, we had a, a call this morning from a guy in Phillipsburg who said, you know, there's only one practice in his area that accepts his insurance um, and they're completely closed, won't even answer the phone. Gosh. So at some point, you know, is there advocacy that could be done or could we, you know, could we help any of these folks with at least trying to direct people to, to a place for emergency care? I, yeah. <laughs> and another thing I wanted to add, they won't be seeing or scheduling any new patients for at least four to five weeks out. So that's gonna present another challenge since we already have limited providers that accept um, or participate with our insurance. Yes, yeah. And I know, um, I think, I know Dr. Alicia's on and she mentioned on the call the other day, you know, that some of the practices are sort of just, you know, clearing the appointment books, um, you know, and then just having to reprioritize every single person. Um, which takes time. Um, and I've really, you know, I know so many offices are frustrated about the, the hygiene, you know, specifications and how they may not be able to bring back their hygienist for clinical care. But, you know, I've really tried to explain there's so much that can be done in an office right now that isn't necessarily clinical care. Um, and, you know, utilizing the hygienist to help prioritize rescheduling and figuring out who needs what and when and doing as much teledentistry as possible. Um, doesn't mean necessarily that you can't run a hygiene department. <laughs> it just means it's going to look a little different and it's going to be less clinical care at this point. Um, you know, I, I don't know. So, and I think we've had a handful that have really embraced that approach, um, but others maybe not so much. Well, the office that I just mentioned to you earlier seems like they are, that's they're up a couple weeks ahead of the other side of the state. So their hygienists were in, they were doing all that. They, they kind of triaged the, the schedule for the dentist and, and really were helping get that all running. You're right. That's what they were doing. A lot of calling and, and getting that schedule done up correctly. So that's why she said, I'm very comfortable now that we're ready to start because we've prioritized. So yeah, you're right. I think that's a great use of a hygienist. Yeah. And they take our insurance, so I'm excited. <laughs> and education, because honestly, I talked to a medical person yesterday who was shocked that her dentist called and canceled her cleaning and her kids' cleanings, and now they're scheduled out until December, and she couldn't understand why. And I'm like, you, you work in the medical field. You don't understand aerosols and what's going on right now? And I mean, so if somebody with a medical background had a hard time. I mean, what's, what does somebody without that medical background think? And so I think being able to explain that to the patient in a way that doesn't scare them, but that shows them that you're doing it because you care about them um, is really helpful as well. I mean, she was like beside herself that now it was December. And I mean, it was because she's been so drilled to know that she should go every six months. So I guess that's the positive in all of this, but at the same time, how do we help patients to understand why appointments for June are being pushed out to December? Her name wasn't Susan, was it? Maybe. <laughs> here, here. Uh, well, and the PPE issue too. I mean, I think we have to, to, to promote that. We have to show people that yes, dentistry is still important, um, but we have to allow that PPE supply chain to recover. So, you know, it's not saying that routine dentistry isn't important or necessary for your health. Um, and I think the way we do that is by using our telephonic capabilities and video and, and really doing those increased communications with patients. Um, that's something that I, I haven't heard a ton of. I've seen a handful of letters, you know, where, hey, my dentist sent me this letter and it says we're going to do all this infection control stuff. Um, I've also seen a handful of our stakeholders um, that have done some really great videos and like educational things for their patients. So, you know, what, silly, you know, whatever, even if it's a flossing demonstration, um, but something that you can do to really keep that communication going. Um, I think there's a part in that for, for our work and for all the work of our stakeholders that we can ramp up that communication with patients. Um, 
So, you know, I don't know too, you know, we've got a couple of the MCOs on the line. I don't know if there's anything, um, you know, that you guys have been able to push out to the providers to sort of talk about that a little bit. No. <laughs> All right, so what is the role of tele teledentistry there, right? So if we're canceling six month appointments, can we, instead of just totally canceling them, put the hygienist on the phone with the patient, go over the caries process, go over home care, have that face-to-face -face interaction for the time being? Well, you guys, there's a bunch of uh, UPMC hygienists on the, I can see our names. So you guys all know we're, we're telephonic right now, pretty much that's all we can do. Um, and basically, um, I know what I'm doing is I'm trying to do, like you're saying, Helen, educating patients and definitely Kelly telling them, you know, you may be missing that six month appointment or your children are, and your home care right now is the most important thing you can do. So my talking point has been, um, even though you might miss that cleaning appointment, you have to do, be so vigilant at home now to do really good home care and discussing the brushing and flossing and also encourage them to see if their dentist um, is doing teledent, if they have a concern or they want to speak with the dentist to call and see if that's an option that the office would be doing. So, um, you know, I've seen that as well. There's a, a pediatric dentist near me again, who's... Um, She's starting the teledent, and it seems like I think it's going to be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any of my coworkers want to? I think you've pretty much said it, Nora. Um, you know, just uh, that outreach, and I, you know, we're finding that so many of our members are so appreciative, you know, that we're thinking about them and that we're concerned you know, for their dental health. Um, I've had so many questions, you know, from, from members. I know that, you know, calls that used to take, you know, maybe, you know, maybe two minutes, three minutes, or now sometimes taking five, and I've had some even longer than that, um, you know, just asking questions about what they can do. But I think that's, and Kelly too, that's, you know, that education is so important you know, to get that out right now at this point until we do get more of these offices, you know, able to open and see, you know, see our members. Hopefully we will retain those providers. Um, I'm hearing a few things that some of the providers, you know, aren't going to accept some of the MCOs, um, at, at least until they get back and fully up and running. So that could be a real issue. I have a question. I was hearing before COVID that when you were making your tele your calls, that about 40% of the folks, 40 to 60, um, would not accept appointments and really didn't want or and or really didn't want to talk. Are they more willing to talk to you now? 100%, especially mm -hmm. early on. Literally every call I made, somebody answered. Um, it's it has definitely slowed back down. I think there's also the fear that it might be a creditor call no, exactly. or something like that. So um, yeah, at first, oh my gosh, they were thrilled to get the call, yeah. Interesting. Yep. So, so how do we create <laughs> mm. something that helps patients know that they should expect those calls and, and invite, you know, and be willing to take them? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> While there's silence, Kelly and Jan, I'm looking forward to seeing you this afternoon. Two o'clock. <laughs> For those, yes, uh, if anybody has never um, heard of or attended or been involved with the National Oral Health Conference, there's a, they moved it to a virtual setting this year. And so they're running all their sessions starting today, every Friday, um, for the next month. So um, we've got tons of education and learning happening and I'm sure we'll be sharing some resources out from PCOH around that too, um, because we're gonna be attending most of those. Um, we had this session set up first, so <laughs> they booked over us, we didn't book over them. <laughs> you, can, you can go back and listen. It's, um, it's yes. available till October. 
So, yes, yes. So Thanks, we'll be... <laughs> Go ahead, Jan. I said, hi, Eve. Thank you. Yes, I've been straddling the two um, all day. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I chose the wrong week to um, give myself a haircut. So just be pre-warned if you're planning to be on the committee, I mean, on the call. Okay. <laughs> See so, you guys. So Jan, I'm curious to know how you felt, if you saw the Surgeon General, what you thought about his slides. I thought they were really good. Um, no, I did not. Okay. The, he had some really informative things about um, kids getting care increasing and it was, and then, you know, it, it was good data for data. Okay. So I'll, I'll download them and get them to Helen. She can get them out. She's awesome. Back. Was that the plenary, the, um, was that yeah. the evening session? And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The um, and that's something too. I think that you know, for for many of you might be aware that this this year sort of was kind of a banner year for oral health, and we were assuming it would be sort of a whole whole different perspective we'd be taking on things. Um, 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of community water fluoridation. Um, it also is the year that our Surgeon General is putting out a new oral health status report, which um, hasn't been done in, in many, many years. And then um, also is the time when we're writing our new Healthy People 2030 objectives as a country. So, you know, every 10 years we have these objectives we try to meet. Um, and so we were really looking forward to this year being sort of the, the time that public health was going to accept oral health. We were going to be able to really promote it in so many ways. Um, and so I'm just saying that in that if anybody has any idea, um, you know, of different ways or if you could use resources from us to sort of help promote those things. Um, you know, we're still following. So it's a good reminder um, that Dr. Adams is, is highlighting oral health as the Surgeon General. Um, and I think he's a pretty big advocate. He understands yes. some of the needs um, around. Um, I saw him speak last year at a conference and he very much understands the connection with opioids. Um, and I think that sort of goes hand in hand with a lot of the work that he's focusing on. So um, it's a good year to promote oral health. Um, and that's something else that we, um, again, maybe a silver lining side of our advocacy work is that as we try to get adults into care, um, particularly adults that are either uninsured or maybe don't have the best provider access um, because of Medicaid eligibility, um, that we're, we're sort of hoping that this has been a wake up call where every person in our state is now having access issues with dental care, um, that we could sort of use this time with our legislators and with our, our departments to talk about why dental health is so important and why not having access is a big deal. Um, so I just sort of remind everybody of that if, if it helps in your work at all. Um, is that you know when you hear of a story of somebody really struggling to seek care um, who maybe isn't the typically underserved population um, that's a story that's good to share with everyone so i was gonna make a joke but i probably shouldn't i was gonna say do you think those legislators who are probably getting their haircuts illegally are gonna notice that they <laughs> sorry <laughs> If they need a root canal, they're going to notice. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the one thing I can say is I, I'm not wishing dental pain on anyone, I swear. Um, but I do know that true stories and people's stories are what matters in so many situations. And so, um, you know, we just, we just saw, and thanks to Amy for forwarding this, I hadn't seen it, that um, Senator Casey just tested positive for antibodies for COVID. So, um, you know, he had it back in April. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the more when these things actually hit our decision makers, um, then they tend to take things more seriously. So, but I'm not wishing dental pain on anybody. So. Um, anything else around, um, you know, I know we touched on some things, I, and probably not everything, um, but 
Any thoughts just in terms of, you know, how providers are handling this? Um, you know, do we think that there's going to be a reluctancy in um, returning to, you know, typical gatherings, conferences, continuing education? Um, you know, do we see that world changing a little bit? I see some nods. Well, some of that's going to depend on where vaccine becomes available, right? The other interesting thing is singing, people who sing, um, choral events and, and um, rehearsals are at risk. So trying to figure out how to rehearse and sing and yeah. Yeah, I think this is just all interesting. And I definitely think things are going to be a little different. I think if they can do things virtually, I think they will go to that that mode rather than in person. Yeah. I right. Don't know. This is Jan. I think, um, you know, it's really going to depend on the state as well. Um, some states are focusing more on the economic impact instead of the health impact. And um, I, you know, I hate to say it, and I hope that um, they're not motivated to make um, unwise health decisions based on economic impact. But there definitely is an an, an economic um, um, benefit to having meetings face to face with flying f folks and hotels and all that kind of stuff. So, right, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and where. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Jen. I was actually going to say almost the opposite of that. So I think now that organizations have seen how much they can save by going to conferences virtually, they might actually expect that and want more of that, especially for smaller organizations, nonprofit organizations. It's more cost effective to stay home. Um, and that might actually drive the future of conferences. So I don't know, two sides to it, but economics definitely play a role. I can definitely see what Kelly said and I agree with her and I'm also seeing that people that were um, how do I say what they, they call themselves computer illiterate have really learned how to work a zoom meeting and work on computer now because because they were forced to so I don't think those people are going to hesitate to take an online course or whatever anymore, you know, so those that normally would went to live courses because they were afraid of the computer have had their training now. <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say from PCOH's perspective, um, I know many of you have joined us on a couple of these other calls as well, but it definitely to us is not the same as when we can get 50 people in a room and really have some good conversation. And I know everyone tries, but you know, it, it very much, um, I, I feel like at least for our work, um, I don't know how we can really replace that, that in-person um, touch. It, it very much for a coalition, you know, it's not the same thing. And even for our advocacy efforts, you know, we had a meeting with um, Senator Martin's office yesterday. A little different when you're not getting to walk into the Senator's office and shake hands and have that have that approach when you're just Zooming with everybody in their, their home office. Um, so it's, I don't know. Um, I hope I hope that we can at least you know maybe have some smaller gatherings you know in some time in the future that that at least allow us to have that that time to share face to face. Um, they're definitely and we've always done a lot of our work virtually. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we all work from remote offices, so um, Zoom has been in our wheelhouse for years. Um, before you know, there used to only be a uh, a six digit number to join <laughs> or a two digit number for participant ID and now there's a six digit number. Um, so, you know, we were, we were Zoom before Zoom was cool. And um, I, I do feel like it's been different. Um, so as somebody who was really comfortable with that all before, I'm still really missing my in-person stuff. So. I, I agree too, because I think that a lot of, um, committee work or, or when you have breakout sessions within that, I mean, 
you really can't do that in this virtual mode unless everybody breaks away and then gets into another, you know, virtual group, you know, to do that and then gathers back together again. I think that, that, and that's so necessary, you know, especially for a lot of different conferences that you do that you have to sometimes have those breakaway groups. Yeah. Zoom does have a breakout feature for what it's worth. <laughs> Oh, do they? Yeah, we oh, can yeah. put people in the breakout rooms. Yep. Oh, yeah. you can do them randomly. You know. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Learn something new. Randomly, or you can do them in in a given order. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's well. There you go. So, and, and that may be you know a long term. That may be where we're where we're at. But I mean, we've been the state has been working on a new state health assessment. Um, you know, which many of you have probably heard of or been a part of. Um, and that's where they've been doing all of their meetings. I mean, the, the state health assessment cannot be delayed because of COVID. Um, so, you know, really making sure that, you know, we've, we've been in those in environments now where they're putting us into breakout rooms to work on different focus areas of the state health assessment. So <laughs> kind of neat. Um, and it is, it's funny, whereas in the larger environment, people are very quiet. If you put five or six people in a room, they talk a lot more. Um, you get a lot more feedback and everyone feels like they have a chance to participate. So good to know that as we start to, to plan out um, any possibilities in the fall, as of right now, our September meetings are still booked. Uh, <laughs> but um, we, you know, we may uh, have to change that as time progresses. So, um, but I think it's also a good thing to keep in mind with dental patients as well, too, is that, you know, they're going to miss that face to face time. Um, so as we're, we're doing things telephonically and trying to keep in touch, um, you know, making sure there's that piece of it, too. So Any other thoughts or concerns or anything that PCOH can help anybody with or issues that you've uh, struggled with? because um, we're not going to keep people past the point of uh, no discussion here. Um, just want to <laughs> thank everybody um, again for, for sitting through some of these meetings and really allowing us to sort of pick your brains and, and hopefully share some of the information that PCOH has been working on um, so that we can move forward um, for the rest of the year, hopefully being more informed and, and really trying to address the needs of the communities and, and our state. So. Thank you all very much, um, and we will talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.